countries are now telling their citizens to get a booster. Our program today brings together top officials and leading experts to explore how such severe vaccine inequality emerged, the challenges of COVID-19 vaccine distribution, the role of intellectual property protections, and public-private partnerships in meeting production and distribution goals, and more. As the world looks to end the coronavirus pandemic, what will it take to ensure equitable access to vaccines across the globe? Thank you all for tuning in, and a big thanks to our partner, Brand South Africa, for helping us make this event possible. A few housekeeping issues before we get started. We want to be sure we can hear from you, our audience. We have hundreds of people tuned in here on Zoom, as well as watching live streams on social media. We've reserved a portion of this event for questions from our audience. Here's how to write to us. If you're on Zoom, click on the Q&A button below and submit your questions. Please be sure to tell us your name, organization, and where you are writing from. If you're joining us on the phone or watching the live stream, you can email us questions. The address is events at foreignpolicy.com. Of course, we encourage you to chime in on social media. Use the hashtag bridging the vax divide. All right, let's get started. I'm delighted to start our program with a perspective from the government of South Africa. Welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Naledi Pandor. Minister Pandor began her career as an educator and since 1994 has had a long tenure of representing South Africa in various government roles. She led South Africa in an overhaul of the education system. And in 2019, Minister Pandor transitioned to her current role as Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. Welcome, Minister Pandor. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be on the program. Yes, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so I wanted to start with talking about recent news, which has angered a lot of people in South Africa after the emergence of the Omicron variant and South Africa's very helpful role in revealing this to the rest of the world. And it seems to, to many observers that the response to that discovery and that sharing of information was for the rest of the world to shut its borders to South Africa and then to many other African countries uh, after this variant was discovered. How does your government feel about that? And uh, what would you say to the rest of the world about that policy? Um, well, um, I think you're, you're correct to, to refer to a sense of anger. I think uh, closely linked to the anger is disappointment because uh, South Africa has made extensive efforts to ensure responsible uh, uh, addressing of the uh, virus in our country, as well as on the African continent. And of course, we've been extremely vocal about the need for uh, vaccine access uh, equity throughout the world. Uh, the reason we found the reaction uh, rather illogical uh, uh, and very, very strange was uh, that we were surprised that uh, leaders, world leaders, uh, seemed to have a belief uh, that due to the fact that uh, large proportions of their populations were vaccinated, uh, they were now uh, uh, somehow uh, extremely uh, safe and free of the virus. This, of course, um, remains something that scientists have constantly uh, reminded us to guard against, uh, that access uh, to the vaccine and being vaccinated does not mean we should stop practicing non-pharmaceutical measures. Uh, we need to wear masks. We need to avoid large uh, uh, crowds maintain social distancing and so on. So uh, firstly, uh, I believe the reaction was based on a really inadequate understanding of the nature of this virus um, and how variants and the virus itself uh, behave. I, I really uh, think that uh, we congratulate South African scientists in being so transparent as to reveal uh, their identification of the presence of the Omicron uh, variant in South Africa. And it is that transparency which then punished uh, our tourism and other uh, economic sectors in South Africa because the world rushed uh, to ban us. Uh, we've called it a 
an apartheid travel ban because it was largely against black and African countries. But uh, in addition, um, we were fairly uh, astounded, really horrified, uh, because the WHO has given very clear uh, evidence as to how we need to conduct ourselves in terms of a scientific and clinical response to the advent of, of the virus. For me uh, and for South Africans, uh, this is really a reaction that is closely linked to the selfishness we have witnessed with the hoarding of vaccines, um, the lack of uh, support to low and middle income uh, developing countries worldwide. And it just further illustrated the prejudice uh, that exists as our leaders, particularly the global rich uh, countries respond uh, to this terrible pandemic. Thank you. And I'm wondering, in South Africa, uh, the percentage of, of vaccinated people is still quite low. Uh, I, I think in the 40 percent range, is that about yeah. right? Yeah. In your view, what is the issue? Is, is there something else going on beyond this vaccine apartheid that we've been talking about and the lack of access? Is, is there also a problem with the government's messaging in terms of getting people uh, to, to take up these vaccines, or are there things that the government perhaps m might do to increase access? I've read that a lot of South Africans who, who live in poorer areas aren't able to access vaccine sites so easily. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about that challenge and, and what the government is doing to, to try and get those numbers up. Well, certainly uh, there is a, a challenge with respect to reaching um, the most uh, distant areas of our country, I think the rural uh, areas, but uh, we've had a number of campaigns underway, um, government leaders, political leaders, uh, leaders of non-governmental organizations have been very active. Uh, we have vaccination weekends where leaders from the top right through society uh, go out encouraging people uh, to come forward and uh, get vaccinated. I think uh, what may be uh, part of uh, the outreach prob problem is we are not sufficiently using uh, local uh, institutions. So I think now we're talking more about uh, greater involvement of the religious community, uh, the uh, sporting sector. We're even talking about mandatory requirements uh, for persons to be vaccinated when entering uh, public places. But there is a great deal of influence uh, of some political leaders and certain religious groupings that are against uh, vaccination and have used uh, social media uh, very effectively to convey a message of fear to uh, the broader population. Um, that, you know, the vaccination doesn't make you uh, uh, well, uh, you're not immune, um, and in fact, you can get ill, and some persons who had been vaccinated uh, died, and so on and so forth. So a lot of fear-mongering, uh, which we're having to deal with in public uh, communication. We've discussed the need to ramp up uh, uh, the communication program, and to involve uh, personalities in society uh, that enjoy a great deal of public support, uh, personalities in the entertainment and the creative arts uh, industries, just to you know, generate a, a message uh, that people should come forward. What is interesting is among the 50 and above, you do have quite a significant proportion vaccinated. And it's when we introduced the 18 to uh, 40 that you saw uh, the lower numbers. So younger people who are the users of social media uh, need, I think, much more persuasion and a bigger communication effort. And we're going to be getting that underway. Thank you. And going back to the issue of access and some of your comments uh, about global pharmaceutical companies, I was wondering if you could comment a bit on the issues around local production in South Africa. There have been some breakthroughs recently in that regard. Um, was this a major barrier earlier in the pandemic? And what has your government and, and some of 
the companies in South Africa done to try to address this in order to achieve a more secure supply domestically? Well, um, one of the things uh, that we have uh, said to ourselves as a policy decision is we must never find ourselves in a position where African countries are at the back of a queue of waiting for a solution to a very serious health crisis. The fact that uh, we had not devoted sufficient investment in investing in vaccine production uh, is something that has caused us to respond very urgently to enhancing uh, the existing capacity in South Africa. We are fortunate that we do have a good foundation that with investment we'll be able to ramp up to uh, vaccine production uh, levels. We also are working with other African countries, as well as with international partners, including the United States of America, countries uh, in Europe, to make this happen. Because uh, all of us have accepted that uh, the inability to expand vaccine production is a very serious barrier to us successfully addressing this pandemic. Our concern is on the continent, uh, less than 10% of the African population that should be vaccinated is vaccinated. South Africa is doing better because we have access, but uh, many poor countries on the continent do not have access to the vaccine. So uh, certainly uh, giving greater attention to research and innovation, and building partnerships that help us to be productive is important. Finally, we do believe uh, that regulations uh, around intellectual property access, uh, technology transfer, um, the management of patents in times of crisis, we think these regulations under the ambit of the WTA, uh, WTO need to be relaxed temporarily in order to allow us all to participate in expanded production and to have uh, access. One question about pharmaceutical companies and, and deals being made elsewhere. I, I'm curious how you feel uh, as a member of the South African government watching wealthy nations roll out booster shot programs at the moment when such a large proportion of your own population is still unvaccinated and an even larger proportion of some of your neighboring countries' populations remain largely unvaccinated just at a time when a new variant is running rampant and many would argue emerged precisely because of low vaccination rates in South Africa and surrounding countries. And so what does that look like uh, fr from the South African perspective to see uh, what's happening in the US and UK and elsewhere with boosters? Well, um, you know, I recall um, when the uh, WHO declared to the world that we had a global pandemic, uh, world leaders came out in huge numbers making public statements that uh, this was a global problem. And once a solution was found, and they hinted then at the possibility of a vaccine, the vaccine would be a public good for the globe. Lo and behold, when the first vaccine became available, we realized that uh, countries had ordered more than three times the number of vaccines that they would need for their populations. And they began to really practice denial of equitable access uh, to the rest of the world, not just to Africa, but even among themselves as neighbors in Europe uh, and elsewhere. So um, we really uh, need a much more uh, multilateral approach to the resolution of problems that are common to the entire world. I think we would have gone a long way toward preventing the emergence of new variants and continuing episodes of the virus had there been attachment and practical action on the concept of global uh, public good. So I think um, that the world now, I hope, has learned a lesson that hoarding 
of a particular treatment when the entire globe is faced by a common problem does not do the world good. All it does perpetuate the emergence of new variants, perpetuate the need for more closures, and it doesn't assist the world to address a very serious uh, health crisis, which we all need to address working together as the world uh, community. So I am uh, extremely disappointed that this one opportunity for us to show that global collaboration can make a real world difference. We unfortunately have leaders who have failed the test and who failed to come up uh, to the level we needed of cooperation uh, throughout the world. And finally, um, what would you say to pharmaceutical companies and uh, <coughs> governments in, in Europe and the United States? What more does South Africa need um, in order to tackle this, this vaccination problem? And uh, you could also speak for some of your neighboring countries as well. What, what, what sort of policy solutions do you think could make a real difference at this advanced stage of the pandemic when so many people thought it was almost over and now it seems to be erupting in perhaps the biggest wave yet? Um, well, I think uh, the first thing I, I would uh, really recommend we look at is greater sharing and cooperation in research and innovation. So that I think is critical. Uh, secondly, I think we must build as we've begun to do capacity in different parts of the world so that uh, when a crisis occurs, we don't have parts of the world able to respond and the rest unresponsive. Thirdly, South Africa with its limited means has decided to make some vaccines available to the poorest African countries. Due to inadequate budgetary means, we're unable to match what many countries, uh, rich countries have been able to do in donating vaccines. And I should be upfront and admit that. Uh, we have had very good donations by the United States. There has been a commitment uh, to the COVAX a facility, although not enough, but certainly uh, a commitment to that. We in South Africa, through my department, uh, we have an African uh, development fund, are making over 2 million vaccines. It's totally inadequate, but it's within our ability. This morning, I was reading the amount we've had to set aside for that. In South African uh, currency terms, it's over 200 million. So my final point would be that when there is an international health crisis of this kind, the pharmaceutical uh, sector needs to look at its price levels because at times part of the barrier is the cost of the treatment. It is extremely expensive, even where the world is under terrible threat. I think when there's an emergency, we need to respond in a different way because there's a crisis, and you cannot hold to the same profit-making levels when you're faced by a very dire situation in which you need all the world to be able to prevent itself from becoming sick from this virus. Thank you so much, Minister Pandora. That was uh, an excellent presentation and very informative. I think we will debate some of these ideas uh, with the panel that's about to join us. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, as a reminder to those of you watching, you can submit questions to the speakers by submitting them through the Q&A function or emailing us at events at foreignpolicy.com. Now we are going to take a deeper dive into issues surrounding the making, distribution, and organization of uh, COVID-19 vaccine programs. We have a large panel with us here today to help us take a closer look. I'm pleased to be joined by Thomas Quaney, the Director General of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations based in Geneva, Kate Elder, Senior Vaccines Policy Advisor from Doctors Without Borders Access Campaign. She's joining us from New York. Fatima Hassan, the Founder and Director of the Health Justice Initiative, joining us from Cape Town and Sai Prasad, president of the Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturers Network, uh, 
and President of Quality Operations at Bharat Biotech International. He's joining us from Hyderabad. Let me start with Fatima. Um, you wrote an article for us at Foreign Policy earlier this year. It was 10 months ago to be exact in February. And you wrote in that article, the hoarding of supplies and knowledge the world now faces is the very real possibility of not achieving global population immunity anytime soon. At a time when new variants and strains are emerging, effectively disrupting health systems, lives and livelihoods everywhere. In the middle of a global pandemic, this means that no one is safe. Looking back on your article today, that seems like a fairly accurate if depressing uh, description of, of where we are now. Uh, Fatima, in your view, how could this have been avoided? So I think we warned already in March of 2020 when you know, COVID had first uh, been declared a pandemic of, of, of uh, global epic proportions and, and a crisis that you needed to deal with some of the systemic issues, including intellectual property barriers and the different uh, intellectual property challenges to be able to scale up production. And so what we saw instead was, as Minister Pandos you know, spoke about earlier, talk of solidarity, but instead what we were met with was a lot of secrecy, a lot of drip feeding of supplies. And the notion that we would have a vaccine declared as a public good, but wasn't treated as a public good. So inherent in the failure, I think, in the last 15 months is that there's been a hoarding not only of supplies, but there's been a hoarding of knowledge. And that has actually you know, contributed to what we've warned about already earlier this year, late last year as well, which is vaccine nationalism. Uh, it manifests in the over-ordering of supplies. It manifests in the, the way in which uh, certain countries are treated as preferential customers. Um, and so we have a situation where we were dealing with two aspects of boarding, but time was also not on our side. And I think the, the events of the last few weeks, particularly the way in which this variant is playing out, the number of cases that we're now seeing in the UK, in Germany, and many other countries, which is going to have an impact on supplies going forward as well because of the uh, you know, desire by many countries in, in parts of the global north to start administering booster shots to their adult populations as well as to, to, to younger children. So timing has not been on our side or time has not been our, uh, on, our, on, our, on our side. And this has meant that we basically, you know, many of us in Africa, and, you know, we talk about vaccine apartheid. I mean, you, you know, I, I grew up on apartheid. So I know what it's like to be a second class citizen. But basically, the, the bottom line is we were last in line. I mean, we were last in line because of, you know, a really pernicious form of boarding. Let me ask you one other historical question about South Africa. I think many people in our audience are aware of this, but South Africa has deep experience with a prior pandemic during which lack of access to life-saving drugs led to many unnecessary deaths. You were involved uh, during that period um, in uh, activ activism surrounding uh, access to AIDS drugs. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what we can learn from the AIDS crisis era in South Africa about the situation today. Thanks. I mean, you know, the, the problem with the AIDS crisis was that we were also dealing with really severe intellectual property barriers and protections. I mean, that eventually culminated with the DAR declaration. But when you have a situation where you have companies and CEOs calling the shots, exercising a lot of control, insisting on non-disclosure agreements, you know, high levels of secrecy, very little price transparency, that's what the minister was talking about uh, earlier as well, and prioritizing customers based on income category versus based on public health need, that's when you have the situation that we have today, which the WHO itself has called morally grotesque. Where, where you have the haves and the have-nots. And what we thought we had learned from the HIV AIDS crisis, particularly in, in Africa and in South Africa, was that we wouldn't have a repeat of the situation again, that we would have bolt in flexibilities within the TRIPS agreement that could allow us to use the necessary measures available to many countries around the world 
to be able to deal with a public health emergency. And what we've seen is the is you know is actually the opposite. So what we thought was going to happen after having learned the lessons of the HIV/AIDS crisis in this particular pandemic did not materialize. And this is why there is so much emphasis and I think a lot of momentum. You may have seen the developments both in in Ireland and in Scotland in the last 48 hours around the requirement for a temporary suspension of intellectual property protections, not just on the vaccines, but on all you know, COVID-19 related technologies. And I think that the minister's right when she talked about the, the, the spread of variants, the self-defeating public health strategy of hoarding has basically you know, come back to haunt us as at the end of 2021. And, and remember, Sasha, you know, with HIV AIDS, there were available to, available ARVs that could have prevented a lot of a lot of loss of life and death. That is what we call premature suffering and death. And so when we talk about vaccine apartheid and vaccine nationalism, with the momentum that we have and the vigor that we have and the passion that we have, is because we have seen what withholding essential technologies can do to parts of the world. We 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 know what it means when communities basically lose people, when jobs are lost, when economies suffer. And this is a situation that could have been averted. Thank you, Fatima. Thomas, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like you to respond to that. Has uh, the pharmaceutical industry, in your view, repeated the mistakes of the past? And if not, what's changed and what still needs to change, in your view, before the next pandemic? I think a lot has changed since the HIV AIDS crisis, because when you look at the HIV AIDS crisis, it basically took 10 years after the approval of the first uh, combination treatments to reach patients. Here in COVID-19, first, we had the fastest development of COVID-19 vaccine ever, 326 days instead of four years, which was the fastest so far, Ebola. And we had the largest scale-up exercise ever. Pre-COVID, the global vaccine capacity manufacturing was 5 billion. This year, just for COVID vaccines, we have more than 11 billion vaccines developed. This is a daunting number, and it wouldn't have been possible without unprecedented partnerships, collaboration, voluntary licensing, and technology transfer. For example, uh, we have seen more than 300 partnerships. We have seen more than 200 of them involving technology transfer. I, I see here on the screen Sai Prasad, the chairman of the developing country vaccine manufacturing network. We wouldn't be where we are now without these partnerships, without the sharing of knowledge. And sharing of knowledge is far more than uh, the IP because the patent wouldn't give you the knowledge, the know-how to scale up and that we manage to scale up on such a large scale is because we jointly decided to call out, for example, the, 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 the hoarding of rich countries. We in May went public and said, rich countries really need to start those sharing. We also different to the AIDS crisis Instead of the 10 years, WHO approved, gave the first emergency use listing to a COVID vaccine on December 31. Within six weeks, you have had the first vaccines arriving in Accra and Kigali and Abidjan, literally the same day the first vaccines reached Tokyo. Now, when we look at it, we have to acknowledge the world was really not pursuing the prioritization which WHO had recommended. One percent of frontline healthcare of the population are frontline healthcare workers. Ten percent of the global population are vulnerable, in particular elderly. And I think many countries, including in developing countries, have dismally failed on that. Having said that. When you look at COVAX, the initiative of WHO, Gavi, SEPI, and UNICEF, where DCBMN and us are partners, set out to supply 950 million doses this year to develop to AMC countries, countries who get financial support for the vaccine procurement. End of this year, there will be somewhere between seven and 800 million. 
which is about you know, 15 to 20% below the original target, which will be missed by probably by two months. That is really a shame. But when you look at the reasons for that, two major ones, even some of the biggest vaccine manufacturers struggled to the, come up with the vaccine. Three of the four b- biggest vaccine manufacturers failed in developing a COVID-19 vaccine or are delayed in developing one. We had seen big bumps in manufacturing. Some of the most experienced biological vaccine manufacturers sort of messed it up and it didn't scale up as hoped for. And we did have a big problem because COVAX and Africa rely to a large extent on exports coming out of India and because of the crisis the health emergency in India in April, May, June this year, nothing has come out of India since April 1. When you look at these challenges, 60% of the COVAX supplies have come from innovative vaccine manufacturers. We do see that the problem right now is no longer supply constraints. The vaccines are there. It is about vaccination. Uh, I think many of you read a couple of weeks ago South Africa did reach out to two vaccine manufacturers and ask them, please slow down your deliveries because our warehouses are full, you know, at current vaccination rates for some time to come. Therefore, we have to look at what can be done to make sure that we really vaccinate people who need, because let's face it, Omicron is another wake up call. And if we do not succeed in vaccinating the world, poor or rich, wherever people live, we will dismally fail. Okay, let me ask you something about hoarding, though. You mentioned it earlier, and and you talked about rich countries hoarding vaccines and that being part of the problem early in the pandemic. But that strikes me as quite a state-centric analysis of the problem. Pharmaceutical companies are powerful international players, and they have leverage uh, in markets, and they make contracting decisions and they negotiate with those governments. Um, So what could the pharmaceutical companies have done differently to prevent the hoarding among rich countries that occurred early in the pandemic? I think, first of all, you have to take into account before the hoarding, you had hedging because many countries signed up early advanced procurement with big vaccine manufacturers without knowing whether these vaccines would ever reach the market. And some of those I already mentioned. And therefore, from hedging, which is a natural, I think, safety valve, uh, some countries such as Canada, for example, had uh, advanced procurement for up to 10 doses per person living in Canada. It wasn't just the US or the European Union, they moved to hoarding. And I and, and the problem, of course, for manufacturers, if you do scale up, if you scale up on such a large scale, you rely on procurement orders coming in. And there, that is one of the lessons learned. COVAX was at a competitive disadvantage, and that's something we need to address for the next pandemic, because they couldn't sign contracts before they had the man- money guaranteed in the bank. The Gavi board would not allow that. Therefore, COVAX was relatively late in the game. And the second element for understandable reasons, COVAX was looking at vaccines, which wouldn't rely on ultra cold chain on infrastructure. And also in terms of the manufacturing would be cheaper. And when it turned out that actually the vaccines really scaling up fast, developed fast with the mRNA, these vaccines were literally over-procured. But having said that, when I look at Pfizer-BioNTech, with more than 3 billion doses produced this year, 40% of Pfizer-BioNTech capacity will have gone to low- and middle-income countries this year, either through COVAX or through countries or the African Union signing bilateral deals. But honestly, if we look at future pandemic preparedness, the better preparedness for equitable access and health impact access is absolutely a must. Okay, let me go to Kate. Um, Kate, I'd like you to talk a little bit uh, about who deserves credit in your view for developing these vaccines and who funded uh, the research uh, 
and development, and also, in your view, how pharm pharmaceutical companies might have made decisions differently uh, in a way that could have protected some of the communities that, that your organization, Doctors Without Borders, works in. Thanks, Sasha. Um, I mean, I think it, everybody is of consensus that um, the tremendous, the tremendous um, speed at which COVID-19 vaccines were developed um, is absolutely uh, phenomenal. And we thank the scientists that facilitated that. We also thank the public purse taxpayer dollars that largely funded, for example, if we're going to use an, uh, the company Moderna, up to $10 billion in R&D investment and advanced purchases that enabled that and gave it the jump start. Um, to actually see, you know, the fruits of that innovation come so quickly um, to uh, our arsenal of response to the global pandemic. Um, in terms of, you know, the what do we get for that? I think it's a very important question you asked, Sasha. You're saying, what do we as Medicine Sans Frontières, as Doctors Without Borders, sort of expect for that? And um, the gross inequities right now are very clear in the statistics. I mean, here at MSF, we very much believed in the public health framework that the World Health Organization put out at the beginning of this pandemic as the way to get us out of this pandemic. It was very clear, Thomas talked about it as well, the best bet for resolving this pandemic as quickly as possible and protecting the most vulnerable, starting with healthcare workers and then with the most elderly and vulnerable. Instead, of course, we saw this sort of race to the bottom, if you will, with this extreme hoarding. I do wanna note um, something in terms of the manufacturing capacity because the crux of this issue right now is do we have enough supply, the right type of supply to stem um, these persistent variants and get us out of this pandemic? I mean, Thomas is citing the um, significant scale up in manufacturing capacity. And yes, there has been a tremendous increase in manufacturing capacity. We have to break down and look exactly where that is. Currently 58% of the global supply comes from manufacturers in China and in India. So not from these multinational companies in, in Europe and the United States. 58% of the current supply comes from China and India. We have to look at preference right now, country preference for a specific product, right? We have to see how these products are able to respond to the variants and which vaccines are most efficacious. And of course, with the advent of mRNA technology, um, we're seeing really that lots of countries also prefer that, that technology. If we keep that technology in the hands of just Pfizer, Moderna, and BioNTech, it will be in an impossible way to emerge from this pandemic, right? This is, if we are looking at high income countries, they will never, the supply of current manufacturers will never be able to satisfy that. WHO just said in the past couple of days, um, with the advent of Omicron with this variant, that they anticipate that if high income countries aggressively pursue booster programs, which we see that they're doing, continue to expand age groups to lower age groups, which we certainly see, that there could be a 3 billion dose shortfall in the first quarter of 2022. 3 billion dose shortfall. That's according to the World Health Organization. We've seen Germany recently say that they anticipate not having enough supply early 2022. We've seen the UK government in the past couple of days say that they were not anticipating the significant costs that are gonna come with their booster program, an additional 5 billion pounds that they're gonna to have to recover was not anticipated either from NHS uh, cutbacks or from taxes, the taxpayers, levering on taxpayers. So if we continue to hoard this technology, if we continue to let pharmaceutical companies essentially drive us over a global economic cliff to line their pockets, we are one, not gonna get out of this pandemic and two, we're gonna just see this um, perpetuated in the future as well. So I think those are the very concerning things. Those are the concerning things to MSF and to others here that are representing the developing countries that have been um, left behind in, in truly um, what was not promised to us by global leaders, um, but which very sadly um, came to pass. Thanks, Kate. I'd like to go to Sai now uh, to talk about the Indian angle on this. Um, Bharat Biotech shared the COVAX and vaccine recipe with, with other manufacturers. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and whether you see it as a model for pharmaceutical companies elsewhere in the world. Uh, and if it is, why aren't many uh, companies doing, doing the same thing now? Sure. Uh, thanks, Sacha. Thanks for having, having me over. I think 
I think what we have done um, is a model. Is it, a, it is a good model. I mean, we started out developing a vaccine early last year, and then uh, we obtained the UL in India. We obtained WHO um, emergency use authorizations, uh, in, and we're also supplying in India and other countries around the world. And along the way, we also have signed the tech transfer partnerships with four Indian companies. Uh, one of them already had existing knowledge of manufacturing the drug substance. So that tech transfer was relatively simple and easy, although there were some complications, but we were able to resolve that. But the three other companies uh, have had no prior knowledge of manufacturing the drug substance for, uh, for a human vaccine. So with them, the tech transfer process is a lot more evolved. I think there lies in the balance between what you're asking and what Thomas and, um, is suggesting and what we are doing. So unlike in small molecule pharma, uh, in vaccines, in large molecules, in biologics, that um, intellectual property is one part, but I think technology transfer and handholding and training and development is all, it all goes you know, uh, hand in hand. And it, it's part of a big, I would say, jigsaw puzzle. You can't just have, if you take all the patents that my company has, Bharat has, it would fit in a pen drive. And if I give that pen drive to somebody, there is no way that they're going to be able to make the vaccines that we make. I think these you know, intellectual properties have to be transferred, but then they have to be, I feel that they need to be transferred in a voluntary, man voluntary manner, along with technology transfer, handholding, reagents, uh, so many different aspects. Even packaging development is complicated. You know, for example, last year when we were developing Covaxin, we were thinking already about how this vaccine is going to be used in a poor country like India or other uh, low-income countries. So we wanted to have a multi-dose vial policy, which saves money to governments on wastage. You know, we wanted to make sure that it's stable at two to eight degrees, for example. We're working to see if we can put a VVM on this vaccine. So these are concepts that we know, so we try to engineer them early on in the developmental process. But I think there has to be a balance. I mean, it cannot be just, I mean, you can't force, um, I, I agree with Kate's point, L lots of the R&D is funded by, you know, governments internationally, but eventually it's for a company to, you know, transfer that technology and know-how to other entities. And that cannot be forced. I mean, if, you know, you can give your uh, CVs and publications and resume to somebody, but you can't force what's in, you know, you know, in your brains to somebody else unless you do that voluntarily. I think that's where uh, active discussion and an active participation is required. And coming specifically to mRNA, I think the WHO is doing an excellent job spearheading uh, mRNA developmental hubs in South Africa. Uh, there has been companies selected in Argentina and Brazil. I think there was also a new call uh, recently. Uh, maybe more companies in Asia would also be applying for it. So I think that technology is going to disseminate and be available. And coming to Thomas's point, Thomas's point, yes, you know, earlier on, it used to take a decade or two decades for technologies to come through. Um, I remember in India when uh, hepatitis B vaccine was first available in the Western world and when it was available in India, there was a 20-year gap. And for that, you know, when it came to a rotavirus vaccine, for example, we narrowed that gap to about seven or eight years. And now with COVID, you know, we're, we're lockstep and, uh, you know, uh, in developing vaccines and making it available. You know, we developed an innovative vaccine. Uh, Serum Institute is manufacturing at scale for AstraZeneca. I mean, almost 2 billion doses capacity. Uh, they will do the same for Novavax also when, whenever Novavax's vaccine is licensed. There is another Indian company that's developed a DNA vaccine. They're trying to scale it up. Uh, there is a small Indian company that's working on mRNA vaccines. They've completed phase two trials and similar types of product development activities in China also with inactivated vaccines and adenovirus vector vaccines. And there is also a company that's developing a recombinant uh, vaccine right now. So there is a lot of innovation going on in developing countries. There is vaccine product development, manufacturing, scale up, all aspects are going on. I mean, if you look at only mRNA, yes, mRNA is a brand new technology. It is going to take some time to percolate down. Uh, but I think with this pandemic, just like how it's 
speeding up all activities, even this process will get sped up. And I have no doubt about that. Thank you, Sai. Um, I'd like to go back to Fatima now, uh, specifically on the intellectual property question, which all of you have raised. Um, Fatima, could you explain briefly why, in your view, uh, the TRIPS waiver is necessary and how it would help in South Africa and other countries like South Africa? And I'd like to tack onto that an audience question from Pedram Ramatabadi, who asks, if vaccine patents were given to African countries for free, would they be able to effectively distribute and administer them with the current supply chain challenges across the continent? Thanks. So I think the answer to that is really what Sai said, is that without the waiver, we don't actually have the ability to share the technology and transfer the knowledge. So, you know, what really enrages me is that we, in a situation in December 2021, we have glaring vaccine apartheid, which is going to get even worse. We have the majority of 8 billion doses of vaccines that have been administered into high-income countries, and we're still talking about voluntary measures and voluntary cooperation. But volunteerism and benevolence is what gave us the HIV AIDS crisis. We're in a situation where down the road from me, we have the first WHO mRNA hub has a single company with the mRNA technology, even though it was publicly funded, come to the hub to actually provide the cooperation, to share the technology, to transfer the knowledge? No, because we have companies who are playing God in this pandemic. So without the waiver or without some kind of domestic compulsory measures taken against each of those particular companies, we don't have the necessary cooperation and participation in the mRNA hub. We have effigen and the WHO who have gone on record to say it will not take us maybe three years to reverse engineer because Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna refuse to provide that type of cooperation. So my question is, how can the CEOs of these two companies that were supported with public investment, trials that we participated in, including people in South Africa who participated in those clinical trials, say to us that, no, we don't want to participate in this, you know, mRNA hub, and we'll just drag out our IP monopolies for even longer. And I mean, Kate is right, the WHO has issued the warning bells again. They issued the warning bells in earlier this year, they said we're going to have a situation of gross vaccine apartheid if we don't address scarcity and we don't address the issue of bringing in more manufacturing partners into the system. Even the Vatican has said it, Nobel laureates have said it. So the waiver allows us, Sasha, to, 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 re, to reset. It allows you to ensure that you don't have to look over your shoulder all the time. It deals with more than just vaccines and it deals with more than just patterns. And I mean, there's many briefings that have been issued by multiple organizations. We don't have time to go into it, but it's was supposed to be a temporary mechanism to allow us to be able to do the very types of knowledge transfer in a way without uh, necessarily attracting litigation and long drawn out um, disputes around whether a country could issue a compulsory license or not. So I think that we also just have to have like a bit of honesty. And if we want to say today that we are blaming the countries for hoarding, for over-ordering, for using too much supply, open the contracts. We want to see the contracts, we want to see the vis have visibility on all the supply schedules. COVAX for a year was relying on voluntary measures. Last week, it finally said, we need supply schedule visibility, we need transparency on that. And they were also calling on manufacturers to lift a requirement for indemnification for countries that needed uh, or that's regarded as a humanitarian buffer. So if you have a mechanism like COVAX calling for transparency, I think that we're in a situation where we'd like to know, was it the countries who over-ordered or ordered? Is it their fault for demanding that they get preference over limited supply? Or was it the pharmaceutical companies allowing them to, to basically determine who would get first preference month? And I ask that because we know that through the investigative work of, of the New York Times, it was discovered that Johnson & Johnson wasn't a country. It was Johnson & Johnson, a private company, who insisted that the South African government give them unfettered export rights, which is why when we were facing wave three, the time when it mattered the most, when we really needed supplies, the supplies were not here. When we were facing wave three in South Africa, millions of vaccines were being exported to Europe because that is what the contract with Johnson & Johnson said. And Aspen went on record saying that they actually didn't have control over where those supplies went. It was totally in the hands of j, &J. It was only after that story broke 
that the African Union intervened and the EU decided to pause the supplies of, of vaccines held in Finnish in Africa. I mean, there's many issues that I could Okay, still, Fatima, let me cut know. in there just because we're running short on time. Sorry to interrupt and, and give Thomas a chance to respond. Uh, Thomas, I know you think that the TRIPS waiver uh, it, it, it is a sideshow and not the real issue here. And I'd like you to comment on that, but I'd also like to frame it more broadly and get your perspective on uh, whether life-saving medicines should ever be seen as a public good or if they're just a commodity. And, and if they should be seen as a public good, uh, under what circumstances and, and what would that mean policy-wise? I think in the pandemic, early on, we committed to, you know, the ambition and, and objective of global access. In terms of responding to the waiver, actually, Sai has said everything before me. Uh, you cannot coerce knowledge sharing, know-how sharing. The partnerships, the tech transfer we have seen on an unprecedented scale happen because companies can rely on a legal framework of which actually contracts should be respected is and IP should be respected is an essential part. The IP waiver, for example, since Moderna was mentioned, Moderna has clearly announced they would not enforce IP, but that doesn't mean that you can just take the patent and you will be able to reverse engineer do it. You really need to have this done voluntarily and scaling up would not have happened without this voluntary. The second element which I see is a year ago, one and a half years ago, Sai and I, we were both part of the call to action establishing Act Day with WHO, with global leaders. I was personally, you know, concerned. Everybody talked about vaccine is a global public good. Now, the problem, if you're an economist, a public good, you know, that is something which is available in unlimited amounts. And at that time, we didn't have a billion vaccines yet. Therefore, talk about the public good where you need 11, 12 billion doses to vaccinate the world. But these 11, 12 billion doses first have to be manufactured. That's why I really think we need to call out the solidarity of countries, the rich countries with the poor. And I agree with Kate. Uh, the dose sharing really should have done because when I look back at what WHO presented in terms of priority, the 1% frontline healthcare workers, the 10% vulnerable, which means the elderly, that is something which is realistic, which is targeted. But I recently, I must say, I was very much impressed by an article from a colleague from Kate Elder saying the one size fits all. You know, these targets of 40% or 70% vaccination, that's the wrong simplistic approach. And this was a person running the operations of MSF. It wasn't the industry. We need to be aware of oversimplified answers to very complex questions, but we need to do better on equitable access in this pandemic next year, as well as in future pandemics. Thanks, Thomas. Let me go to Kate uh, so that you can respond to that a bit, uh, but also address the question of, of where we go now. Um, we haven't talked about COVAX much. A uh, few people have mentioned it. That was seen uh, at one point as, as a solution, it, but the, the, the rollout um, of COVAX vaccines for various reasons mentioned um, has not been as, as expansive as hoped. So what could be done to, to assist that rollout or what other policy measures could be taken now, given all of the things that have happened already, uh, what many on the panel would regard a, as mistakes and, and injustices along the way. Um, what, what is the path forward in your view at this stage? I think Thomas has said very you know, clearly, you can't coerce uh, pharmaceutical corporations to share their technology. Um, he said that very, very clearly. And we understand that pharmaceutical corporations you know, their primary objective is to make money, right? I mean, the currency in which they do it is through um, life-saving medical, medical innovations that people need. So if that is indeed the bottom line, that you can't coerce it through global means, like what WHO has been trying to do in setting up this technology um, transfer hub, which has been by and large ignored by the multinationals, which have um, the access to this technology. And what we need is governments that fund this technology to put access conditions on it. And that is where indeed we can hold our, our countries and the United States, European governments that put so much public funding into this responsible because they did not 
uh, amend their their uh, their funding um, with access conditions that we needed. I mean, I think that's that's phase one. Uh, two, we certainly need to strengthen regional bodies. I mean, COVAX, uh, you know, COVAX was a, a very ambitious uh, idea. Um, some would say perhaps, um, you know, overly ambitious and too uh, optimistic, if you will, that it was built perhaps disjointed from the current reality of, of what we saw come to pass essentially. Um, and there are gonna be lessons that are learned from COVAX right now. I think, you know, one lesson that, that people keep citing is that COVAX didn't have enough money um, soon enough in the game to strike the deals that high income countries were striking um, as they hoarded vaccine. Um, you know, just to cite one figure, when Pfizer finally committed uh, earlier this year to sell just 40 million doses, just 40 million doses to COVAX, 2% of their anticipated production this year, they had already promised 75% to high income countries. But if we really think that just coughing up more money is the solution and being able to compete with the budgets of the United States of America and the European Union, we are grossly misguided. This is not an issue of just coming up with more money. This is an issue of changing the fundamental structure of how research and innovation is done, how the biomedical innovation ecosystem is managed, who has the power in it, and then who benefits from the fruits of that innovation. So just coming up with more money is, is going to um, put us on the verge of global economic collapse. What we really need to do is, as Fatima has said very clearly before, we need to examine the systemic roots of why we are here and why we are repeating the crises of the past and make some sub substantial radical change for the future. Thank you. And Sai, I'd like to close with you. Um, we've talked a lot about how supply ha has ramped up and there are many vaccines available, but there are many barriers to those vaccines reaching the people who need them most. What, in your view, can help ensure that vaccines actually become vaccinations in people's arms? Thanks, Sasha. I think, I mean, if you, if you looked at uh, in, during 2020 and even earlier 2021, the constraints were, you know, in rela relation to supply chain issues for raw materials and packing materials, trade barriers, uh, U.S. had the, you know, the Defense Production Act. Uh, some other countries had, you know, artificial trade barriers. So those were causing problems in the manufacturing chains and in scale up and in many parts of the world. I think that right now, as we see it as a manufacturer, has been largely solved uh, unless we see some other major crisis coming up. But where the problem is now is that there is enough manufacturing available, there is enough capacity available, there is enough vaccines available. But these vaccines have to reach the populations where that, are, need, that they need the most. And we can ensure that these vaccines reach them as long as there are no artificial additional regulatory barriers or trade barriers or commercial barriers, for example. Uh, there are countries now that are requesting for local manufacturing. Yes, local manufacturing and local product development is a good thing in the long run, but we can't solve the problems of this pandemic, you know, trying to build a facility today and getting product out of that facility. So I think these are, um, you know, I think, you know, smart, intelligent, mature people can sit together and have a discussion about it and see how we're going to address each of these issues. But any country or any region or any company, even us, for example, we think 20 years ahead as to what are the products of 2040 is what we are thinking today. So I think governments and regional entities have to also have that long-term hat on and think in that long-term and work in a very uh, concerted effort to that. It, these cannot come out of knee-jerk reactions and you know, you know, quick, uh, you know, quick hyperbole. I would say because this is all science. This is metrics. This is physics. This is biology. It just takes time, and and even training and development doesn't happen in a short span. I mean, even if somebody knows how to do, um, you know, if you come to our company, we have people who make viral vaccines, and then we have people who make bacterial vaccines. The two guys don't know what each other is doing, and they they are not mutually their knowledge is not mutually acceptable. Even uh, if I have to move one of some of these people into the other manufacturing facility, the training and development for them is about six months to a year. 
So I think these are complexities of this industry and these complexities are not available in small molecule pharma. So that's where, uh, you know, we get access to, you know, um, a product patent and immediately companies in China, India, South Africa, Ethiopia are able to make those products, small molecules. In large molecules like ours, you need those intellectual properties, but you also need technology transfer. You need handholding. You need reagents. I mean, there are a series of things that are required to eventually have a good quality product to come out. It's not just the you know intellectual property. And I always say that that's that's an important part, but that's just one part, one part of the equation. But there is a series of other activities. Okay, thank, thank you, Sai, and thank you to our whole panel. I'm sorry to. To close, this was very informative, but we are running out of time, and there's still uh, a, 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 another bit where I'm going to be talking with Dr. Stavros Nicolaou. Uh, so, to round out our program, uh, we're, we're honored to be joined by him. Uh, Stavros is a senior executive uh, in strategic trade development at the Aspen Pharmacare Group in South Africa and a trustee of Brand South Africa. He's joining us from Johannesburg. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll have quite a lot to say about what's been discussed on the panel. Uh, I want to start by asking a question that, that Fatima raised uh, that also relates directly to your company. Uh, this idea that there are Black South African workers in a poor part of the country um, producing vaccines that then end up in the arms of Europeans uh, after South Africa has uh, actually helped develop vaccines through trials. Um, how did this happen and, and, and what has changed since then? Um, and if you could just explain a little bit about what your company's involvement uh, in this saga has been from the beginning of the pandemic. Right, thanks uh, very much, uh, Sasha, and uh, good afternoon or good evening to other colleagues in other parts of the world. Um, let me preface my response by making two points. Uh, the, the first is that local capacity solve local problems. And we can never be lulled into a situation of believing that solidarity will prevail during a crisis. It, it's not going to happen. Um, it was predictable. It was not going to happen. So I cannot emphasize sufficiently by having local capacities and sustaining those capacities, and that's the second point that I wanted to preface, is the only way of getting on top of these pandemics, whether it's a current pandemic or any future pandemic. And we should never uh, plan pandemics when they arise. You've got to plan for pandemic preparedness between pandemics. So let me respond directly to your question. Uh, Aspen made its capacity available to Johnson & Johnson fairly early on in the process. We concluded a deal with J&J to contract manufacture uh, on the 30th of September last year. And we were in production in quarter one uh, with the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. Um, as you've heard earlier, uh, Aspen was merely a contract manufacturer. We had no jurisdiction as to where those vaccines went. Of course, we did impress upon J&J &J the need for us to service the African continent. And um, the, the net result of that is that only 8%, granted it was the first uh, sort of first shipments, only 8% of what Aspen has produced under contract for J&J &J has gone to Europe. The rest of it has gone either to South Africa or the rest of the African continent. But that's not kind of good enough because what the point I made earlier, and that's why I've made it so emphatically, is you have to have your own capacities with your own product. And uh, we were able to evolve our contract manufacturing arrangement with Johnson & Johnson to what was a significant announcement uh, three weeks ago now, where we announced uh, a term sheet had been signed concluded between Johnson & Johnson and Aspen Pharmacare. Uh, that gives us the rights uh, to the, uh, the licensing rights. Uh, of course, that means the intellectual property of the COVID Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, that comes along with both technology and know-how transfers. That is a significant development for the continent because that means we now have, as Aspen, our own brand, 
called a Spenovax, and a Spenovax will only be made available to the African continent. So in conclusion, if you want to solve these problems, you have to have your own capacity. It's got to be sustainable. Let me ask you a bit more about Johnson Johnson, because I I understand from what I've read that what they did was quite unique uh, in selecting your company, an African company from a a huge list of of potential candidates. Um, That hasn't happened with with many pharmaceutical companies. Um, And and I'd want to hear what look I think the unique capacities and as much as aligned somewhat um, I think I also need to come in J and J because uh, they had, uh, in fact, they could select from 120 companies globally that they screened initially um, for contract manufacturing. They eventually landed up with 10. Aspen is the only one in the Southern Hemisphere and on the African continent. So it's very, firstly, that speaks volumes, I think, for the continent and South Africa's manufacturing and technical capability that a company like J&J selected Aspen to be a contract manufacturer. So I think that uh, to, to respond again directly to your question, I think there's a new type of partnership that needs to evolve from the learnings. There have been many, many different learnings um, in this pandemic. We can all write uh, volumes and chapters of these learnings. But for me, two of the biggest learnings, firstly, you've got to have your own local capacity, as I keep saying repeatedly on this call. And then secondly, I think you are, it, it requires, requires a new type of partnership to develop capacity and that capacity has to be sustainable. And that's what I think uh, all the different stakeholders, pharma, governments, uh, civil society, everyone needs to come together in that respect and forge a new partnership, a compact, if you will, on how you address these pandemics. And let me just make a final point. The other point is we're speaking a lot about pandemic, Sasha. Um, one of the pandemics that the continent has suffered for, from for years is a, is a pandemic of deindustrialization, where you put up facilities, they're not sustainable because no volume's coming through those facilities and you shut them down. And then you're surprised at the reaction of what happens when the next pandemic comes along. Now, we, we need to break that habit. It's a, it's a terrible habit. And I'm afraid that Part of what's required to be done here is the multilateral and bilateral procurement agencies, as well as the donor funds, need to play their part in ensuring that you have sustainable facilities on the African continent. That means these donor funds that donate money to procurement agencies, who then go and buy these drugs out of Asia or these vaccines out of Asia or Europe or North America, some of that needs to be directed towards African companies. So we don't leave the African continent in the lurch like we have at the moment, and it's still in the lurch. Less than 10% of the continent has been vaccinated. As you've heard today, Europe is on to booster shots, and yet we're not even to a first dose in the African continent. So those are just my observations directly to your question, Sasha. Thanks very much. And just to close, Stavros, a question from the audience um, that that relates to some of what we've been talking about. Um, Nathan Rood asks um, about uh, tech transfer hubs and says that Kate mentioned the need to expand access uh, to the knowledge that pharma companies have in her presentation. And and South Africa is now home to a tech transfer hub. Will more tech transfer hubs in other parts of the world be helpful for for solving these sorts of challenges around access to knowledge? And how quickly do you think that might happen? I'm a a believer in that you need multiple ways of solving a solution, right? You can't put all your eggs in a single basket. 
And I, I think the Aspen model in this instance, and the Aspen model, in fact, Fatima knows this well because she was part of creating an enabling environment in the early 2000s where we were faced with an HIV pandemic. We were then faced with a multi-drug resistant TB pandemic. So I'm a great advocate of uh, sitting around a table with the owners of the innovation and or the IP and finding common ground and uh, concluding arrangements on that basis. Um, I mean, I've heard on this platform and other platforms that it might be three years before uh, you start delivering your first mRNA through the hub in Cape Town. Now that's, uh, you know, that's hardly a, an effective way of dealing with a pandemic that's uh, in the here and now. So I'm, Sasha, more inclined and more favorably disposed towards these bilateral uh, licensing arrangements that involve both tech and knowledge transfers and an element of skills transfer as well. I'll say this with some degree of authority because I've lived it in the early 2000s. We, we pioneered the first generic antiretrovirals on the African continent as Aspen. Prices came down from $5,000 per patient per year down to $180. And that was in collaboration with Big Pharma, as they call it, or R&D-based pharma. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened with MDRTB. There's no reason why we shouldn't be perpetuating that model. It's an effective model and it works. And just in closing, um, to underscore what I'm saying, uh, as I've indicated on many platforms, Aspen has now produced over 130 million doses of, of the J&J COVID vaccine. And we will be in production with our very own vaccine uh, next year. And I suggest that that will bridge the inequality and unevenness of the vaccine distribution that we are all witness to, uh, witnessing uh, today. Um, I think our bigger problem is going to have to then be ensuring we have sufficient supply chain storage conditions and strength of healthcare systems to administer these vaccines on the continent. Thanks Great. very much. Thank you so much, Stavros. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there. We've gone over a bit, but this has been a fascinating conversation. And I'd like to thank you and Brand South Africa for partnering with us on, on this event. To all of our presenters, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for joining us and sharing your perspectives. And thanks to our global audience for tuning in. A full recording of this event will be available shortly on FP's event page. And thank you to our attendees who've attended our other virtual events this year. Our virtual dialogues can't happen without our wonderful audience. This was our last virtual dialogue for 2021, but we have much more planned for next year. So keep an eye on foreignpolicy.com slash events for what is to come. Take care, happy holidays, and I wish you a happier new year than the past two.